so I am Piyush Patel, a PhD candidate at the Biological and Agriculture Engineering Department of North Carolina State University, working with Dr. Mahmoud Sharara, uh, along with my committee members. And I am here to present uh, my study that evaluated impacts of swine lagoon sludge inclusion rate on composting process and the compost quality. I would like to start with a brief in, uh, introduction of swine manure management systems in the Southeast United States, wherein manure that falls in shallow pits beneath the barns is flushed using swine flu, uh, using the lagoon effluent. And uh, the liquid manure enters the lagoons, uh, and it undergoes anaerobic digestion, wherein um, the treated effluent is stored uh, until it can be land applied for the use of nutrients, whereas uh, the recalcitrant uh, organic matter along with untreated feed and the inorganic settle to the bottom of the lagoon to form a sludge layer. Uh, Long-term uh, lagoon operation results into accumulation of sludge and excessive sludge accumulation could lead to uh, deterioration of lagoon performance. It could um, uh, impact the supernatant quality that you're using to apply onto the lagoons whereas it, it could also lead to increased uh, amount of odor vectors from the lagoon and could also uh, lead to a lagoon uh, non-compliance operations. So for all of these reasons, it is important to manage sludge. Uh, so let us understand what sludge is before we get into the composting study. So it is an anaerobic digestion residue, which has a lower carbon content because most of the carbon has been previously utilized in the anaerobic digestion process uh, compared to... Um, freshly uh, excreted manure, it has a higher moisture content, it has a significantly low, smaller particle size, and also uh, is enriched in phosphorus, zinc, and copper concentrations, which require a significantly higher area for its land application, which is of unavailable in these areas of high density swine operations, along with poultry operations competing for the acreage. Um, so, and the existing technologies uh, currently being used for man uh, sludge management uh, do not pose an end solution. And that is why alternative sludge management technologies are needed. And this is where the composting comes in. Uh, composting being an aerobic decomposition of organic matter uh, requires optimum levels of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, along with moisture. And it also, uh, the heat generated during the process helps in uh, Pathogen reduction along with reduction of seaweeds, it generates an organic amendment, which can be uh, utilized and applied to the soils to increase the soil organic matter content along with utilizing the nutrients. Um, although it has been widely adopted for treatment of manure, uh, uh, municipal solid, uh, municipal sludge and food waste, little is known about composting swine lagoon sludge. And this is why we wanted to uh, conduct a study to be able to answer the knowledge, to be able to address the knowledge gap. So the research questions that we came up with was can sludge be used as a composting ingredient with locally available resources? And was, uh, what is the impact of sludge inclusion rate on composting temperatures? How do composting temperatures react uh, along with uh, the weight loss during composting and cumulative gas emissions along with the, uh, the quality of the final product that we produce out of this particular operation. So uh, to be able to do uh, answer these questions, we identified uh, the materials that are locally available uh, at low cost around the swine farms, wherein we have Bermuda hay and yard debris or whole tree trimmings, which provide most of the carbon that is required to, uh, for the process along with poultry litter and lagoon supernatant and sludge being the primary component, um, providing the nitrogen part uh, to balance out the uh, recipe. The lagoon supernatant also uh, was uh, helpful to add the, address the moisture content of the whole uh, recipe, along with yard debris, giving it the required structure to be able to aerate uh, efficiently. So we developed two recipes out of this uh, out of these components, wherein uh, the the first recipe, which is referred to as a low sludge recipe, has almost ten percent uh, sludge include uh, with a ten percent sludge inclusion rate, along with the high sludge recipe having a twenty percent sludge inclusion rate. Both of the recipes were designed um, in a way to uh, meet the 
optimal composting conditions along with if you can see uh, bermuda hay along with lagoon sludge and lagoon effluent contributing to more than 50% of the total recipe weight which uh, in both the recipes which is uh, available on farm whereas the other two components which are, uh, which can be either imported uh, are locally available uh, at a low cost we composted these recipes at a uh, sludge in, uh, at at intermittent aeration conditions averaging around 0.4 liters per minute per kg of organic matter and uh, the intermittent aeration worked in a way that we had a pump on setting for 8 minutes along with a pump off setting for 15 minutes so this was the composting setup uh, we fabricated uh, these uh, the composting modules uh where you can see those composting modules on the uh, left on that particular image wherein it has an uh panel front panel that can be uh, removed off so that uh, if you want to uh during the turning events you could load off the material into a front loader and mix it completely manually uh it also had wheels so that it could be the whole module can be transported onto a weighing scale and weights can be recorded over regular intervals of time it had a perforated floor so that uh, the aerated uh, the forced aeration could be dispersed uh, so that the forced aeration can be uh, dispersed uniformly across the whole pile along with uh, and we use the advanced composting mixers uh, which were available on site uh, to be able to mix our whole recipes the data collection part of the uh, the study included uh, uh, temperature readings collected every 2 minutes uh and then averaged out later to the required uh configuration then uh we recorded modules uh the we recorded the weights of the modules at regular intervals of time along with gas concentrations in the exhaust during a pump on event with which is actively aerating uh, the pile along with a pump off event when the aeration was off uh during the sampling events along with initial samples and the after samp uh the composted samples we uh determine the bulk densities along with the proximate analysis which is moisture content volatile solids ash along with the ultimate analysis giving us the carbon nitrogen and other macronutrients we also uh, have calculated the, uh, determine the water extractable phosphorus zinc and copper concentrations to be able to understand what are the water extractable nutrients and how compost uh, when land applied can help uh, in determining those uh, so last but not the least uh, we after the active aeration part uh, we compo- uh, we let the compost cure for uh, almost about 36 days uh, to be able to generate a stable product so this was uh, this is how uh, we could uh, the whole setup looked like we had six uh, composting modules the low sludge recipe uh, composted in triplicates along with the high sludge recipe composted in triplicates along with the s- set of sensors uh, behind me in this picture so let's move on to this results uh we had these are the uh, so this figure shows uh, the results for the low, for the low sludge recipes where you have temperatures on the y axis along with uh, time in days uh, sorry time in hours on the x axis and uh, the the series re- represent so the red representing the middle uh, blue with the bo- uh, bottom and the uh, top thermocouple temperatures so the temperatures were recorded at three different levels and these are the uh, representative values uh, we after uh, initiation we saw the temperatures go up into the thermophilic range within 12 hours uh, with uh, the middle thermocouple recording highest temperatures across the whole uh, composting duration uh, the temperatures uh, we saw a small dip in temperatures around day 8 but the temperatures recovered uh, immediately and uh were in the thermophilic range which is above the 55 degree celsius mark until day 17 and that's uh, that is when we turned the pile for the first time the temperatures uh and set up the composting modules again um the temperatures rose again uh into the thermophilic range uh continuing to decrease slowly until the day 24 and this is uh, the day 24 was the second mixing event when we mixed the piles completely again along with so after uh, we set up the temp uh, the piles up after day 24 we did not uh, observe any significant increase in the temperature 
and that was an indication that the material has been exhausted and there's no significant potential for uh, degradation any further. So overall, uh, to sum up the uh, temperature observations we had, uh, we were able to meet uh, high temperatures along with elongated temperatures, uh, elongated duration of high temperatures. So that was, we were able to at least um, compost the low sludge recipe successfully uh, based on the temperature. So these are the results for the high sludge recipe. Similar results, uh, similar patterns for the temperatures observed Heat, uh, heat cycle first and second during the first 17 days of composting along with uh, a, another heat cycle um, and then uh, no heat increase uh, down the line. So both the recipes were able to record uh, thermophilic temperatures. Uh, we, uh, we compared maximum temperatures between uh, observed between both of these recipes and observed that there was no statistically significant difference between uh, the high sludge and the low sludge recipe along with continuous duration was compared. So uh, the duration of temperatures, uh, uh, the duration where temperature was greater than 55 degrees Celsius was compared. And we observed that the low sludge recipe had a slightly higher duration, but th that was not statistically significant. We were able to meet uh, the, uh, the pathogen reduction requirements set up by the state and the federal regulations, which need uh, 72 hours of uh, temperatures 72 hours uh, for the temperature to be above 55 degrees Celsius mark. So both of the recipes were able to meet these requirements and looking just at the temperatures, there was no significant difference uh, do, uh, of the highest sludge inclusion rate on the composting process. Moving on to the weight loss. Mm, we, so this was the, uh, the, the figure on the right shows you the weight loss, wherein uh, most of the, uh, we observed a total weight loss of approximately 35%. Uh, with max, most of the weight loss uh, being observed during, day, um, during the first two heat cycles between day zero and day 17, whereas an additional 8% uh, of weight loss bit, uh, on the third heat cycle, whereas no, uh, less than approximately 5% weight loss in the third heat cycle. There was no significant difference. As you can see, the, both the uh, high sludge and the low sludge recipe track uh, similar weight loss patterns, and we approximately had 1.1% weight loss averaged over the 31 day of composting duration. So this weight loss is comparatively lower um, from what we have observed in the literature, wherein composting is uh, supposed to experience up, um, composting uh, approximately 50 to 60% weight loss, whereas uh, it could be, uh, for, for our particular study, it was because of two particular reasons wherein we used a lower aeration rate. So that um, uh, what, uh, that led to lower loss of moisture during the whole composting period, along with the materials that we used uh, were highly, uh, it had comparatively higher uh, amounts of lignocellulosic material or recalcitrant organic matter, which, uh, which so both of these two factors contributing to the lower weight loss observed. The organic matter loss was compared between both of these recipes, and we observed that approximately 30% of the organic matter was lost during the whole active composting duration, wherein most of the uh, organic matter being lost uh, between day zero and day 17, basically the high temperatures, uh, the durations of very high temperature. And uh, although the uh, weight loss observed compared uh, on day 24 was comparatively lower to the day 17, but it was uh, mostly due to the uh, heterogeneity in the sample, wherein you can see, uh, depending on the sample that you have analyzed, you could have a higher organic matter or a lower organic matter. But um, overall, there was no significant difference between uh, the day 17 and the day 24 weight loss. So of the 30%, 35% uh, of the total weight loss that we have observed, 70% of the weight loss was lost in the terms of moisture whereas uh, the 30% organic matter loss was um, observed. And overall, no significant difference in the organic matter loss between the high sludge and the low sludge recipe. We also analyzed CO2 emissions uh, from both the recipes, wherein you have uh, emissions on the y-axis and time uh, on the x-axis. Uh, the, the, uh, the dashed line represent uh, emissions that occurred during 
active aeration events. And as you can see, almost 70 to 75 percent of the emissions occurred uh, during the uh, active aeration phases, whereas uh, the difference represents uh, emissions that ha happened uh, during uh, pump off events. Uh, However, the pump off events were approximately 67% of the whole uh, composting duration. Uh, one important observation here is that uh, most of the uh, CO2 emissions also happened during the uh, durations of high temperature and high weight loss. So most of the temp uh, temperature driving the um, biological activity within the piles resulting into higher CO2 emissions during this period. There was no significant difference in the high sludge and the low sludge recipe, although the high sludge re recipe recording slightly higher CO2 emissions. Uh, we also analyzed methane emissions occurring from both uh, from the high sludge recipe and the low sludge recipe. And a similar pattern could be observed in the emissions, wherein most of the emissions occurred during the active aeration phases, whereas um, one, one key observation here was during the first initial 17-day period, we did not have a lot of emissions observed, but most of the emissions happened after the 17-day period. Uh, and this could be, so methane emissions during composting are associated with anaerobic environments in the piles, whereas uh, anaerobic environments could be due to either increased moisture content, increased bulk density, or ineffective aeration. But we observed that in our both of our recipes, uh, the the moisture content was lower compared to what we uh, started with, along with the bulk density being lower uh, as well. So uh, most of the um, the methane flux that we observed during the later stages of composting being due to ineffective aeration. So um, and the emissions when compared to sorry for the uh, methane emissions when we compared emissions to uh, previous studies, the methane emissions were either on lower, lower range of what uh, has been conventionally observed. So uh, similar uh, observations were uh, obtained during for the nitrous oxide emissions, wherein maximum emissions being uh, during the active aeration phases, whereas also most of the cumulative emissions being towards the, low, towards the uh, end of the composting period. So the, uh, Nitrous oxide emissions can, can be observed uh, either during the start of the composting or uh, and, and towards the end of the composting. And there are two diff uh, different mechanisms that um, lead to these emissions. However, uh, most of these emissions, uh, since uh, based on the methane emissions, we can say that these emissions were uh, linked to the anaerobic environments in the um, uh, in the piles, but we are still analyzing this data and we'll be able to um, report on what the exact causes for these emissions were. Um, last but not the least, we, um, cat, uh, after, after we composted, after the active composting phases, we were able to um, cure the compost piles uh, uh, and submitted these samples to the lab to be able to determine if we are able to uh, generate a compost, uh, the quality of the final product. And we observed that the respiration rate was, uh, was uh, for both of these mixtures was in the stable or the very stable stage, which, uh, uh, which indicates that our product is stable and can be used uh, directly on farm, uh, along with the height of seedlings uh, being slightly higher in the high sludge recipe compared to the low sludge recipe. Um, in, uh, so, and that, that could be due to Mm, the favorable concentrations of uh, nutrients and micronutrients in the high sludge recipe because of the high sludge inclusion rate. To conclude the whole study, we have, um, so the proposed recipe met disinfection requirements, whereas uh, we were, ob um, so, and we were able to, uh, we observed lower weight loss compared to uh, the recalcitrant in a, uh, Sorry, we were able, uh, we observed lower weight loss due to recalcitrant uh, ingredients and aeration rates that we've used in the study. Uh, the um, twenty three percent of the uh, carbon emissions, uh, carbon initial carbon was lost as methane and CO two, whereas two point six percent of it uh, nitrogen was lost as 
nitrous oxide and ammonia emissions. Although these emissions were on the lower side, uh, they can further be lowered uh, using innovative techniques uh, for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the sludge inclusion rate did not significantly impact the uh, greenhouse gas, the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions observed in composting. Finally, the compost uh, generated was stable and mature. And the compost, uh, and looking at all of these results, uh, we can potentially conclude that composting presents as a potential alternative for swine lagoon sludge management. We, we thank all, um, all of our associates who have helped um, to be able to uh, conduct the study along with the funding agencies. And thank you. I can take any questions if you have now. <laughs>